The Tom Woods Show, episode 863. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey everybody, if you love to read, and I know you do, I've got some excellent libertarian ebooks for you that are absolutely free and that will help you make the case more effectively. Check them out at tomsfreebooks.com. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. Just a short little episode for you today. I should have done this last week, but I couldn't make it work. I had to get a few episodes done in advance because I had to go out of town, and you might be interested to know why. You remember maybe that in late 2016, I gave away a 2017 Kia Soul as the first prize in my Liberty Classroom Affiliate Contest. Well, Mike Church was the winner, and as you may know, Mike, formerly of Sirius XM Satellite Radio, has launched his own uh, internet network, the uh, Veritas Radio Network, and he used the car, not for his own personal use, but to raise money for his new venture. And so he was also giving the car away, and on March 3rd, which was last week, he had a big event at a Kia dealership. We, I was up in Athens, Georgia. I drove over seven hours to get there so that I could be with him when he finally gave the car away to the person who really would be the end user, who turned out to be a fellow named Kenneth Snyder. And it was a very exciting thing to do. Neither Mike nor I, you know, neither one of us ever given a car away before. So it was, it was fun, and I'm glad I did it, and Mike raised a lot of money, so everybody was happy. Great, great time. All right, so I just want to say a few things related to the Donald Trump speech to Congress, uh, mainly on the spending side, and I'll have a couple of links for you probably to uh, items on this. Uh, Ryan McMakin over at the Mises blog did a good analysis of the speech. Remember that when we're talking about spending, we're not really talking about spending. Uh, What I mean is we talk about spending cuts, it's all smoke and mirrors because there's so much of the budget that's already spoken for that there's very little room you have to do any cutting if you were inclined to. And Trump doesn't look like he's particularly inclined to. So, for example, Social Security in 2016 was 23% of all federal spending. Medicare was 15% of all federal spending. Medicaid, 12% of the budget and quickly growing. There's that. Not to mention a lot of other things that are more or less off the table, like the Pentagon budget. Well, it wouldn't have been off the table for me, but Trump says we have to increase the Pentagon budget. He wants to increase it by $54 billion. We're going to rebuild the military. Now, it's true. If you look at the raw statistics from 2001 to the end of that decade, you do see that the number of battle force ships of the Navy and Air Force planes, they, the, the numbers do seem to go down at the very moment that their budget is being increased. There's an extra trillion dollars, a couple of extra trillion dollars that were spent on the Pentagon during those years, and half of that went to the wars, and the other half, we don't know where it went because it certainly didn't go into building stuff. So the spending is there. The, the money is already there. The U.S. government, of course, is spending about what the rest of the world put together is spending. And, of course, a lot of these weapon systems are completely irrelevant to whatever threats Americans might face today from unconventional forces. So it's a boondoggle, and unfortunately, it's not one that's going to be taken on by Trump himself. Then, of course, we get the trillion-dollar investment in infrastructure. Now, Ryan McMakin says maybe this will be a trillion dollars of government spending. Maybe it'll be loan guarantees to private companies. Who knows? So we don't actually know that he's going to spend a trillion dollars, but he's gone in for this whole the infrastructure is collapsing thing. So I'm going to link for you at tomwoods.com slash 863, the great article on infrastructure that I refer to often by David Stockman about our bridges are all falling down and stuff like that. And he points out that really the bridges are not falling down, that when we look at the uh, structural integrity of America's bridges, by and large the ones that could use some work are like these little covered bridges, half the time don't even have wheeled vehicles going over them in these 
you know, these sleepy little towns here and there. They're they're not it's not like the bridge connecting you from one part of a major city to another is on the verge of 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 disintegrating into dust at any moment. It's it's not that's not by and large what it is. Most of these bridges are tiny little bridges with almost no traffic going over them. And we're making major domestic policy on the basis of these phony baloney statistics about bridges. On top of that, why is this a federal expenditure anyway? I mean, you could argue the uh, you know the the highway system that Eisenhower put into effect is a federal program. You can argue the constitutionality of it, but you could argue it's a federal program. But generally, road building and infrastructure is is local stuff, local and state stuff. So it's not clear why you would need a trillion federal dollars here. So we've got this proposal for infrastructure spending. We got all the social spending, the uh, entitlement spending and stuff that I mentioned. Then another 2% is transportation spending. Another 21% is military and federal law enforcement. So now you've got about three quarters of the federal budget that Trump is not even going to touch except maybe to increase. Now, elsewhere in the speech, Trump says dying industries will come roaring back to life. This is presumably because he's going to make sure that trade is taking place on a more level playing field. Well, when you hear that kind of thing and you're at a loss as to how to respond, let me give you a good example, and I'll link to this also at tomwoods.com 863. This is something out of Walter Williams, who's been a guest on the show a couple times, one of the great free market guys out there. And Walter Williams recalls that President Barack Obama, in his 2012 State of the Union, boasted, and these are Obama's words, that, quote, over 1,000 Americans are working today because we stopped a surge in Chinese tires. Yay, and everybody cheers, right? All right, well, let's look at, let's dig through that a little bit more deeply. It turns out that those trade restrictions that Obama was celebrating forced Americans to pay $1.1 billion in higher prices for tires. So that means, all right, 1,200 jobs are saved in the U.S. tire industry. But do the math. That means the cost per job saved was at least $900,000 in that year. $900,000 per job saved. Now, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the average annual salary of tire builders in 2011 was about $40,000. So then Williams asks, in whose pockets did most of the $1.1 billion that Americans paid in higher prices go? It certainly didn't reach tire workers in the form of higher wages. Well, it turns out that fewer than 5% of the consumer costs per job saved, according to the Peterson Institute, reached the pockets of American workers. So, and not to mention that people have to pay more for tires, and now they have less money to spend on other things, and anybody who needs tires for various things are, are, is going to be at a disadvantage. All the, you know, th- that is to say other companies that need tires are going to be at a disadvantage. Uh, let's leave all that aside. Where did the extra money go? Well, of course, it went into the hands of corporate senior managers. That's where the, the money goes. So... This is the way uh, Gary North puts it. He says, do you really want higher sales taxes? You do if you vote for any politician who says that this nation needs tariffs in order to protect workers. What he's really saying is that the workers to be protected are senior managers in large manufacturing firms. You, as a consumer, will be required to pay these senior managers extra money because you will not be allowed to buy higher quality goods that have been exported from a foreign country. You're going to have to pay more for lower quality goods that are produced by manufacturers who do not have to pay the sales tax. And so he says, look, if consumers want to line the pockets of senior managers of manufacturing companies, that is certainly their right as free people. But I don't think consumers really want to do this. That's a pretty good point, I would say. I would say, too, that the material on the drug war is just pathetic because there's no idea that Trump has about prosecuting the drug war that hasn't been tried 8 million times before. Absolutely nothing. He has no new ideas whatsoever. And one of my favorite stories I tell in my book, Rollback, is about a big raid in San Diego, heroin raid, and all the agencies that had anything to do with with enforcement of drug laws 
collaborated on this one day where they were going to pounce on all the heroin dealers at once. They knew who these people were. They're going to pounce on them all at once and grab them. And they did. And what was the result? For about a week, it was impossible to get heroin in San Diego. But by one month later, it was right back to the way it had been. The complete infrastructure was back in place for the distribution and sale of heroin. But this time, law enforcement had no idea who was distributing it. And that was, that was what they had to show for probably the most coordinated effort the city had ever seen. Now, there's some okay stuff in the speech, like a deregulation task force inside of every government agency, imposing a new rule which mandates that for every one new regulation, two old regulations must be eliminated. I mean, obviously, we'd be crazy not to welcome that if that actually happens. And then, you know, if he's saying that companies will pay lower taxes and possibly individuals will pay lower taxes, that'd be great. I I doubt my taxes are going to be lowered. Uh, But, of course, what does that mean if the spending stays the same or increases? uh, Who knows? I mean, he's pointing to very, very trivial decreases in spending. You know, this project where he jawboned them into lowering the price of a plane or whatever, uh, that's just not going to cut it. And then you just get all these, the, the typical... I mean, this is a speech that could have been given by a lot of presidents, with the exception of the immigration material, which I grant you is different, and the trade stuff. But other than that, it's all these messianic promises about what government can accomplish. Then he's got this passage about we need to enforce a nationwide school choice plan, which the federal government obviously has no authority to do. Why doesn't he just say, look, let the states do what they want here? You know, let's get the federal government out of it. Let the states come up with their own policies. Um, You know, and he says education is the civil rights issue of our day. Well, that's straight out of George W. Bush. So same old, same old. We, you know, we Americans voted for Trump, I guess. I mean, that's what the Electoral College result says. Americans voted for Trump. And they're getting Jeb Bush in this speech anyway, at least in this speech. And I went and when I was talking to Mike Church, who's been sympathetic, I think, to Trump simply because he's not Hillary Clinton, He was not in a good mood about this speech at all. I'll link to the speech also at TomWoods.com slash 863. But it's, uh, you know, you would think for an outsider, so-called, you were going to get something a little bit edgier, let's say, than than this. But but you didn't. All right. I think that's all I'm going to say. I got to run anyway. I had a crazy day today. But I want to mention another website created by a listener of the show you're going to like a lot. It's CameronJEnglish.net. Cameron, C-A-M-E-R-O-N-J English.net. And the site covers science and public health policy from a libertarian perspective. Now, that is filling an important gap. For example, he's got a post on how Trump is going to influence science policy in America. Well, very hard to get dispassionate looks at any of that sort of stuff. So I think you're really going to enjoy this particular site. It's um, I mean, I'm looking at it right now. There are a lot, there are a, a bunch of posts that you'll find interesting. I promise. There's a post from just last Friday, March 4th, 2017. Tax diet soda or you're racist. Uh, the Seattle Times is arguing that if you tax only sugary soda. Well, minorities consume more sugary sodas than white and Asian people, so we should levy an equitable tax on diet sodas so that everybody's paying the tax, even though the point of the tax would be to try to get people not to consume sugar. I'm not here to argue the merits of diet soda, just just the merits of idiotic arguments about racism being everywhere. But anyway, science and health policy over at CameronJEnglish.net. I'll link to that too at TomWoods.com slash 863. Remember, of course, if you get your hosting through my link, I'll mention you on my show, give you a nice juicy link on my site, on the episode where I mention you, give you two dozen video tutorials, plus membership in my exclusive secret bloggers group, where we all help each other out with all kinds of uh, Questions that people have, problems they need solved, we solve them all together. So check that out if that interests you at TomWoods.com slash publicity, and I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.